know um the other folks are going to be joining us um and then i know folks kind of just come in and go um well hello everybody uh, my name is nadia uh, with stop lapd spying um also teacher and um so uh looks like Matias just started the recording um so just a couple of things just for folks to know um we we do keep the chat um basically um in the sense like not you can't just type into the chat to everybody uh and the reason for that is because we've just we've had quite a few zoom bombers and so um so that's kind of part of the reason we do that so um but of course oh it's open okay good nice <laughs> uh so that's good to know um i i like when it's open because i think then it does you know folks can just put in their comments but um but we will be keeping an eye on it of course um so yeah so um We'll go ahead and get started. So let's um, share screen. Uh, I don't know, uh, Matthias, are we going to be sharing screen or should I? Okay, cool, nice. Um, and just to kind of let folks know what we'll be looking at today, um, we'll be basically. So this is the War on Youth um, monthly webinar. So this is basically where you know we come together to look at uh, where the fight is at um also you know bring people up to speed maybe if folks this is their first time kind of giving a little bit of a background uh and then we you know of course because we know there's various aspects of the fight of war and youth and you know we build with many individuals and orgs um we also like to join us as well um so as you can see on the screen this is what we're going to be looking at today and um just as we as we go um really want to encourage folks if if anything if we and if we go too fast or if you have questions on anything please um please feel free to to put your questions in the chat um feel free to raise your hand we can also call on you and unmute you um so you can um you can ask us any questions um and then we also have our wednesday working meetings which is uh the third wednesday of every month um this usually it comes the week after our webinar but this uh, month because the way the dates worked it's actually going to be tomorrow so um so that's kind of our time the third wednesday of the month at 6 p.m is basically where we like dig into the work so we do like we look at different researching um you know strategizing and things like that so um so yeah let's i think go to the next slide please um, so just to kind of give folks a little bit of background uh, on the war on youth, I'll, we'll go through this kind of quickly, want to really make space for uh, for what the webinar is about today. Um, this this fight, we really co-organize um, a lot with the Palestinian youth movement. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please, as well as, of course, other orgs, youth, uh, parents. Um, this is the stalker state. I, uh, some, I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is really what we ground our uh, our understanding of the war on youth um, in, right? Um, in terms of like looking at the various aspects of how young people are targeted in this um, by the stalker state, right? So of course we have the public sector, um, which includes schools, social media, um, the police, um, et cetera, et cetera. In the middle, we have LAPD architecture of surveillance because LAPD is the police department we're taking on. Uh, we're constantly uh, going after them, right? Um, in the middle, we have what's called the fusion centers, which is where as information gets funneled in, um, you know, information that gets collected on people goes into these fusion centers and then um, gets shared out. Um, and of course, I'm going through this um, pretty quickly, um, you know, to kind of get to things, but um, but feel free to ask any questions too about this. We have the private sector um, and, you know, read this kind of like a Venn diagram, right? How information kind of gets shared with each other. Um, uh, and so the private sector is um, looking at how companies and corporations make money off of our communities. Um, and then of course, um, on the right, we have the Department of Homeland Security which is where some of the programs we're gonna be talking about today um, come from, the Department of Homeland Security, um, FBI, et cetera. Uh, also, sorry, I just wanted to pause and um, I forgot to invite folks to um, go ahead and um, if you're comfortable, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, your name, if, you, if you'd like, if you're comfortable sharing your pronoun and um, maybe what brought you here today. Um, I meant to say that before we got going, um, so. So yeah, that if you if you'd like to do that, um, we invite. 
Um, so it's it's always nice to know what brings uh, folks to these meetings. Um, let's see, I see this question here. Is there a way to save? Um, oh, <laughs> I just saw your message, Matthias. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, looks like comment is gonna post the link. Um, yeah, feel free if anyone else has any questions to put it in the chat. Um, okay, if you can go to the next slide, please, Matthias. Um, so like we always uh, say, surveillance and criminalization of youth and their families um, is not a moment in time, but a continuation of history, um, because we know these programs um, are a continuation of oppressing our communities, but of course, so is our resistance and so is uh, fighting back. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just real quick, this is, um, so with some of the programs, right, we're going to be looking at today um, are really rooted in this idea of behavioral surveillance. Um, so seeing how behavior gets criminalized and targeted. Um, and thank you. I see folks are introducing themselves in the chat. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, just your name, if you're comfortable sharing your pronoun and what brought you here today. Um, so thank you, Sydney and Lou. Um, so yeah, basically the SAR program, it, um, in 2008, this national program was created um, and LAUPD of course has its local version of the SAR program. And we know, be, we know that uh, criminalizing behavior and uh, targeting uh, youth of color, black and brown youth for their behavior is nothing new. Um, this dates back to colonization, um, to slavery, right? And so, so monitoring uh, behavior is nothing new, but what SAR did is it really legitimized it. And so some behaviors it names as suspicious are things such as taking a photo in public, asking a business their hours of operation, writing uh, notes in public. Um, so really common things people do um, are deemed as suspicious. And on the bottom there, you see this definition that if, an, if a behavior such as the ones I mentioned is observed, that can indicate that somebody is thinking about committing a crime or a or terrorist activity. Um, so we really see this kind of like really looking at targeting even just thought, right? Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So that really then laid um, more groundwork for what's called a CVE or countering violent extremism. And so this is a program um, from the Department of Homeland Security. And LA is one of the three cities that adopted it in uh, 2011, in addition to um, Boston and Minneapolis. And um, basically its idea is, according to CVE, they have what's called this radicalization theory, which is total bullshit. <laughs> um, but basically what it says is that as people are on this pathway to radicalization, right? Um, they, want, they want there to be these off ramps, right? And so this really also ushers in this idea of community policing, which is, which is a really big uh, way, a big part of the reform that's happening, right? Instead of abolition, we see this push towards community policing, which essentially what it is, is it's getting community members to, to snitch on each other, right? And empowering, uh, empowering racism and white supremacy. And so in CVE, it's looking at giving grants to or community organizations, even nonprofits, right? Um, to basically police their own communities and then report that back to the Department of Homeland Security, to the FBI, um, and, and, you know, and of course other agencies, local police as well, right? So think of that stalker state, there's various moving parts um, to this. Um, and so um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And so basically within CVE, right, now there's also this thing called PVE, um, right? We call it the alphabet soup. And so what PVE, preventing violent extremism is, is basically the version of CV CVE that targets specifically young people. So looking at K through 12. Um, and it essentially says, it, it's, it was created by the FBI. And it basically says there's different behaviors for people to look out for. Um, so when I say people, they're looking at like teachers, students, um, counselors, other school staff, um, and basically telling them that these behaviors um, are could indicate that a young person is on a pathway to becoming radicalized, to becoming a terrorist 
or a violent extremist. Um, so things such as uh, on, this, on the screen, you can see there, right? Questioning authority, not doing well in school. Uh, I mean, I have so many of my students not doing well in school right now. So many of my students questioning authority, you know, you just read these um, or expressing anger or frustration, um, being in poverty, being too much into your culture, being an immigrant, feeling isolated. Um, so a lot of these things that, um, that are very natural to what it means to be an adolescent, right? So these are considered then suspicious behaviors. And essentially what this does is, is um, this then what CVE and PVE have done is they have really kind of built on this gang narrative that we see that has been around for decades to target black youth, um, brown youth, um, as and now kind of transitioning it into this idea of violent extremism and terrorism. So really bringing these two narratives um, together. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so, so yeah, so like it says on the slide, um, what we see is is how a, a viewing of black and brown youth as potential gang members, as well as potential violent extremists. Um, and so we see both of these narratives are very present. Um, and it's not like one is replacing the other. They've been intertwining together now. Um, even before 9-11, a lot of people have this idea that the terrorism narrative came after 9-11. Um, really 9-11 did bring it a lot more to the forefront. Um, but um, we see especially youth from Central America, Black youth have been experiencing both of these um, label, labels now for some time. And so what we see then is these policies like CV and PV that are inherently anti-Black, anti-Muslim, anti-Indigenous, anti-youth. Um, and so, um, so yeah. Uh, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so, so what it, what we have seen there is right is seeing then this idea of treating young people as threats to national security, right? And so, so of course we know that the police have been harassing um, youth, uh, youth of color, black youth, um, forever now since the beginning of the police. That is their purpose, and so and, and so now this has been taken to a national level of national security, and so you see then more and more agencies, um, you know connecting with each other to essentially target young people. Um, but as it says there, um, people have been building power, people have been fighting back. Um, resistance is nothing new. And so um, so what we see with this, with the fight on war and youth, we see that as part of you know, this much larger um, resistance that's been happening for, for generations. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so basically, uh, I'll go through this super quick. Um, so what we see now, there's been different updates now to CVE, uh, um, countering violent extremism, right? Um, just as a reminder, CVE was created under the, like through, from the Democrats. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of putting, you know, a lot of times we see on the mainstream level, um, communities of color putting their sort of chips in with the Democrats, but they're, um, you know, if anything, sometimes they're even sneakier, right? Because pretending to to be on our side, but but no, we know that that's not the case. And so Biden has really kind of amped up CVE and really doing it in the name of going after white extremism, right? After the January 6th thing with Trump and the Capitol building, there's been this push now to, um, to uh, implement more of these anti-violent extremism policies. Um, but we know that um, the state says it's to go after white supremacists and extremists, but that's just not the case when the state itself is white supremacist. And so, um, so these are just some of the updates um, that we see, right? So even like uh, looking at the fourth bullet point, for example, so it's now considered a national priority area, right? And so seeing all the money that's going in. And um, at the last meeting, we looked at some of the TVTP grants, which um, on bullet point two, you could see stands for targeted violence and terrorism prevention. Um, and those grants are going um, not only to local police, but even to organizations, youth organizations, um, you know, the, the transition sort of probation type um, agencies as well. And so, um, so more and more money is being funneled into this under the Biden administration. Um, and so, um, 
Um, and so what we have too then is what's called um, the threat assessment and threat management as well. Um, that is, is very directly working um, within the schools, including here in um, LA. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. And so these are some of um, the frameworks. I won't necessarily read them all, um, but basically what we, I kind of highlighted uh, the big word, like sort of the main ideas. So you can see the words they're using, like public awareness, community engagement, um, support services, right? Um, so they're really, the state, in the Department of Homeland Security, the state is really trying to make this seem like hey we're not you know we're sort of hands off this is you all this is the community you're you know taking care of each other um but but it's really just a new label for the same shit right it's it's a new label for this for for policing um for engaging in violence and really like i mentioned earlier turning people into, into snitches on each other um and so right and then of course we have number three right threat assessment and management you know, if you work with in, in schools, um, you know, or, or in other public service spaces, you know that this is a constant thing that is being looked at, right? Assessing different threats that could like harm the students, right? And so of course, all, if you look at all four of these things, you know, you're like, well, yeah, we wanna support our, our young people. We wanna make sure they're not, you know, they're not threatened. We wanna make sure there are communities engaged with each other, publicly aware. So, so essentially, they co-opt um, a lot of the language that we use in our, you know, in when we build together. So these are these like prevention frameworks that um, that are part of um, of CVE. If you can go to the next slide, please. And so when we look at um, LA, right, um, we have um, what's called the START, so School Threat Assessment and Response team right so we have different part of these agency partnerships building and um you know i'm i'm sure folks who work in schools or especially if you're like a counselor i'm sure you've heard of start um and so what we see here then especially with LAUSD, we see these partnerships building um which they've been there of course um but more and more we see building between lapd the sheriffs LAUSD. And really um, increasing the involvement of the, the LA County Department of Mental Health. And that's one thing about CVE um, that is really, it essentially pathologizes um, you know, uh, Muslim communities, Black communities as inherently having mental health issues, like as if, as if people of color are more susceptible to mental health illness. Uh, and of course, A, that's that's just like, you know, we know that's flat out racist, but B it really then undermines the actual mental health issues that do exist, right, um, in our communities that really do need to be addressed, that aren't being addressed, that get addressed with um, violent policing, right? Um, uh, so I know I'm kind of sharing a lot, so feel free, of course, to put, put some questions in the chat. Um, and, and yeah, and um, this is something where, so as I was put there, there is something we're continuing to research. So uh, we'll share also our, our, chem, our fight interest form. You can um, add your contact there. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so now I'll pass it over to Matios, but if I uh, just want to pause and see if, uh, and so Matios is going to give us an update on um, PATH, uh, which is, uh, sorry, I thought I had some slides in here, but my bad, but PATH is essentially a program um, called, uh, known as um, Providing Alternatives to Hinder Extremism. And this is basically um, LAPD's local version of CVE um, and PVE as well. You kind of, it's kind of looking at it like that. And it's bringing together the mental health unit LAPD has, the gang unit, and, um, and so what it's doing is it, it essentially is funneling this money into, into furthering these threat assessments, right? Into targeting young people under this guise of violent extremism and, um, uh, so, and, and you know, anti-terrorism measures. So, um, so I'll, uh, yeah, so let me just pause and see. I shared quite a bit. Does anybody have um, any questions? Um, any slide you need us to go back, you could look at, um, I'll just take a pause if you want to raise your hand or put any questions in the chat. <clears throat> I 
I don't see any hands raised or anything. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. That's fine. Um, feel free, like I said, if you do have questions as we talk, um, right, like feel free to go ahead and, and share. So I'll go ahead and I'll pass it to Matios. Um, and he's going to basically give us an update because PATH has kind of been in the works and now it's um, making its movement. Um, so um, go ahead, Matios. I'll, I'll let There's you know. a question. There's a hand up there. Oh, oh that, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Julie, so Julie, go ahead if you want oh, yeah, to go ahead, Julie. Um, yeah. I put my question in the chat, but basically what I wanted to understand was um, from a student's perspective, what does this feel like? What what are they experiencing? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So um so here, so one thing I, I forgot to mention as well is, um, and I'll give kind of an example um, in England, right? And then, and then I'll bring it home to, um, to here. So these programs are modeled off of a program called Prevent. And the reason I'm bringing up England is because it's much farther ahead um, than the US version of CBE. And so Prevent over there has already, for example, made um, teachers mandated reporters or anybody who works with youth a mandated reporter, right? So if you're not reporting these things, you know, you lose your certification, could go to jail, get fined, right? So over there, it's actually, it has led to, um, so there's, uh, you know, families being denationalized, deported, um, young people being questioned, um, there was one example of a, a, I don't know, the kid was really young, maybe four or five years old. And um, he basically did a drawing at his school, four years old. Thank you, Celine. And he did a drawing and the, the teacher said, you know, well, what is that? And he was drawing his father cutting a cucumber. And I guess she didn't understand him the way he said cucumber. She thought he said cooker bomb. Of course, being a Muslim youth over there in England, um, you know, there's a lot of very intense racism, uh, you know, from folks from, you know, in England there as well. And so um, he, she reported this teacher, uh, sorry, she reported the student and then the family was brought into questioning, right? And so, um, so, right, so we see there, it's being, it's much farther ahead. Now here, this is, um, you know, it's probably about like 10 or plus years behind, right? Um, but here what we're seeing, so for example, like when a student right now is brought into questioning or is, makes any kind of a quote unquote threat, right, the police immediately get involved, there's counselors who get involved, Department of uh, uh, DCFS, Department of Child and Family Services. And so what we're going to see now is this playing out in the same way, right? So now adding another layer to, um, to essentially criminalizing and coming after the young person, right? So now adding this violent extremism narrative as well. Um, and, um, and yeah, and of course, this is, the, this is also the thing too, is um, there's, because it's kind of in the works, it has been hard to really find and expose some of these very concrete examples. Um, but we, but I mean, families have been surveilled um, under this, under these programs are going onto databases, are being followed around, are being harassed and targeted. Um, and anyone else feel free if they want to answer that question as well. Um, you know, I know Akhil, Celine, Matios, anybody else want to add to that? That, that is a really yeah. good question. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Akhil from Stop LAPD Spying. Um, one thing to remember is, you know, that this program, as Nadia said, it really builds on the suspicious activity reporting program, which basically makes a secret file on a person based on the, the initial sort of moment of somebody's suspicion of them. And the fact that they had that file is visible to a cop when the cop pulls them over. Not only that, but that file exists in a federal spy center where other agencies, including ICE, have access to it. So sometimes the, the, the tangible effect might be hard to see from the original you know, the original action is somebody reports somebody else for suspicious activity in the police file, a SAR, you know? But the end result of that is that whenever that cop might pull that person over, and by the way, due to the fact that they have all these other technologies, including license plate trackers, et cetera, they can literally track that person's movement too. And then when they pull them over, they have quote unquote reason 
to, to treat that person initially for, with a lot more suspicion, right? And then if ICE, as you know, by the Biden administration is also, you know, pushing them to do is in certain ways, as, as each time the Democratic uh, administration is in power, they say that, you know, I should prioritize people with criminal records, different, you know, people among um, un undocumented people that have different uh, other conditions, other, you know, so the fact that somebody has a suspicious activity report and that's housed in a DHS, another uh, Homeland Security Center where ICE has access to it too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're filed on young people as well, yeah. And, and basically the, the PATH program that Matthias is gonna talk about is literally citing the suspicious activity reporting program as a huge success. The LAPD sa says that in their grant application and they say they're training and they want to create um, 500 new trained teachers, educators, and clergy to report youth for basically this suspicious activity with an extremism flavor. So you can see that, that yeah, exactly, as Nadia is saying, that the SARS are discriminatory. So the effect might be not immediately, you, can't, you might not be able to see it immediately tracing back to the program, but what it does is it casts an entire community and lots of youth under intense suspicion and extra targeting under the eyes of the state. And I think we had one comment from uh, Hamid. Want to jump in? Yeah, I just quickly wanted to, uh, uh, you know, respond to Julie's question too. Thank you, uh, Matthias, uh, on the students piece. So Julie, there are documented cases where we were able to get these documents uh, on about 1800 SARS that were filed. Uh, and this was just purely on photography. So there was this one case about Brentwood uh, uh, art school students who were on a field trip uh, for photography. And these are photography students. And uh, so they were all, uh, as they were taking their photographs, they were questioned, they were stopped by the sheriffs at the time. This was the LA Sheriff's Department. Um, and then the, the suspicious activity report was filed and opened on them. And now, you know, what, what, what has happened is so, and then they pass it on to Joint Terrorism Task Force at the, at the Federal Fusion Center is what Akhil was talking about, which is a, a warehousing, a spy center, um, which then gets uploaded into their, their databases and their systems, which can then be accessed by every agency, not just law enforcement, but public sector, private sector, law enforcement, educational institutions, international agencies, so your name has basically been put out all across the globe uh, for all practical purposes as a suspicious person. So then, you know, I mean, as things can happen, it is, so I just uh, wanted to add that, and that yes, it has definitely happened to students as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for asking those questions as well. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Matios, who's going to give us an update on the PATH program I mentioned and um, where it, it is at now uh, here in the city of LA. Yeah, thanks so much, Nadia. Um, hey, folks, Matios with the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. I use him pronouns. Um, and yeah, so this slide says LAPC fails because uh, one of our members, Tiff, um, you know, who, who's part of um, LAPC Fails, who's a member of the coalition. I should explain, LAPC Fails is a coalition of organizations comprised of uh, a Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, White People for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, um, who actively participate in the police commission meetings um, and call them out on their shit. Um, and so one of our um, members, TIF, uh, actually flagged the fact that um, the TVTP grant uh, that was awarded to the LAPD was on the agenda at the police commission. Um, and so TVTP, which uh, Nadia touched on earlier, is um, it stands for Targeted Viol Violence Terrorism Prevention. And it's uh, a rebranding of the same CBE program, uh, Countering Violent Extremism, we saw um, uh, get squashed in 2018. Um, and so with any grant, with any award, with any donation that goes to the LAPD, it needs to be approved by the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Um, and so that's what this meeting was. Um, obviously the coalition um, mobilized opposition. Uh, you know, we, we uh, Akhil and Celine and Nadia led um, the creation of a statement 
that other organizations signed on to. Uh, everybody I mentioned earlier signed on to it along with Students Deserve, um, LA Can, um, just a clear resounding no. And um, so I, I'm gonna show you guys a clip in, in the next slide. And uh, it's uh, from the Board of Police Commissioner, uh, the Board of Police Commissioner's president, uh, William Briggs, who um, ironically is actually um, the nephew of a civil rights um, uh, leader, um, Dorothy Chase, uh, I'm sorry, Dorothy Height. Um, and it just goes to show how it, these oversight bodies never really provide any oversight. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we, you know, this is uh, kind of his response to the myriad of opposition that came uh, in response to um, um, the TVTP grant. So Nina, if you wanna press play on that. Oh, folks, I'm not hearing that. I don't know if you are. Okay. I think the, um, yeah, I think we have to share audio. Let's try it again. Cool, it should work now. Let me know if folks can hear the, the audio. Um, I understand. So, Nina, you know, I think it might be easier to, because there was a time um, slide right there, it might be easier to refresh the slide. Or, uh, yeah, at least. Cool. Bronx. I understand from the weekly calls and letters that we receive. Some of you deny that crime is on the rise. That position, as explained in detail by the chief of police today, is not grounded in reality. Okay, so yeah, I actually had my slides flipped. But yeah, so uh, here instead we see that he's just um, um, quite mocking of the uh, folks calling into dissent, the same LAPC fails group. Um, and, you know, he's just parroting the police chief's uh, point. But the next slide we see, um, <laughs> sorry about that, his response to uh, the TVTP opposition. So maybe if we can go. Wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Decker, do you have any questions? Um, Captain Long, I, I, I just want to ask some real pointed questions um, that are derivative of some of the public comments that we've received. And so I'm just going to, in rapid fire, ask you these questions. Um, is this program designed to target the black community? No. Is it designed to target the black Muslim community? No. Is it designed to target the Hispanic community? No. Is it designed to target any particular community? No. And then he says, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just, yeah, we're seeing some, yeah, Jamie, totally felt that way, Hamid, beyond insulting for sure. Um, and this immediately preceded like some mild opposition from another commissioner, Bonnet. Um, yeah, it, it, does anybody want to remark on that? You know? I'll just say that before Bonner even said his mild opposition, he assured everybody there that he is gonna vote yes. He was like, don't worry you all, I'm gonna vote yes on this. I just wanna ask some questions first. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if anything, for me, this just highlights the fact that, you know, you can't oversee this shit. You can't reform it. Um, it's definitely gross. Um, yeah, and so it, it obviously passed the, the commission there, uh, but because it's such a large amount for the grant, the next steps are um, that it would be um, agendized and voted on in city council. Um, but, you know, we're gonna fight it before it even gets there uh, and we'll be mobilizing to that front. So um, if folks wanna stay plugged in, um, we're, we're gonna be continuing efforts to, um, squash 
um, this TVTP grant before the LAPD can get their hands on it. Uh, do folks have any questions, any comments? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to add how like um, like the police commission or the police board, um, how that's it's usually it's a it's a like even the the so called like difficult questions or like questions where they attempt to question like the programs or to get to like the the harm of that it's still like their questions don't do anything and it's still a rubber stamp it's still rubber stamp towards the same programs and. Um, regardless of whether or not they talk about it, it's they don't really they don't do much to to address that. And so, I just wanted to uplift or, or state how like it is a it is a rubber stamp um, approval that they tend to like all the the grants and all of the those programs they tend to just rubber stamp it. Yeah, totally. Me. Um, yeah, it, it's a farce. It's a total sham. And so, Julia. Uh, I'm sorry, Julie asked the question, what does uh, TVTP stand for? It's targeted violence and terrorism prevention. And what is the funding for? That's a great question. So it's to train 500 quote unquote community members um, to uh, effectively uh, call, like uh, assess risk factors in you um, to uh, criminalize and target them and highlight them for extremism. And these community members are educators, they're counselors, they're people that the youth are accustomed to trust them. Uh, it's all about weaponizing that trust to um, target these youth. Yeah, um, it says a culture of deputization and snitches for sure. And so, if folks haven't already, um, definitely uh, hit, you can direct message us to plug into our work group meeting, but also uh, follow LAPC Fails on Twitter um, for updates. And there's also a link there to join the MailChimp um, so you can engage in these conversations. Um, and better combat this shit. That's all I've got if nobody has any more questions. Jack Decker, do you have any questions? Matthias, we have a question in the chat. Yeah, does the larger LA community know and understand this? Um, do, I mean, Julia, are you asking about like the efficacy, like the lack of effectiveness of the oversight committee or the TVTP grant in particular? Um, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, do they understand this plan that they're basically looking around to more or less um, <laughs> Turn, turn the community into an intelligence agency to report on each other. Um, you know, are people, are, are people, because I, I know like for so many things, people just aren't even aware of what's going on. And I'm wondering like, is, are people aware? Do they know this is going on? Yeah. Okay. I mean, other than activists. That's a great question. I, so, you know, and maybe Nadia or Akil or somebody can speak on this more so, but so this is a rebranding of that countering violent extremism grant we talked about. And the reason that was squashed was because so many um, UTLA and other educator groups kind of rose up and said, no, like we reject this completely uh, because they understood that it targeted youth. Um, and so, you know, this is part of their tactic of rebranding uh, a harmful program, renaming it targeted violence and terrorism prevention. And it's the whole act of reform where you uh, kind of shuffle the deck around and then kind of uh, rebrand the harm. Um, so folks don't really know that this is that same thing, um, just in shinier packaging. Uh, Nadia, Akil, Celine, anybody want to? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think like what you said, Matthias, is really one of the main aspects of it. Is it is constantly being rebranded. Even the Department of Homeland Security came up with a memo that said, "Look, as people start building power against this program, we need to rename it." Like this was literally what they said. So. Um, so that does make it difficult, but um, but people do know, right? Um, but they're just, I think though, because we're really in this moment of where a lot of kind of the mainstream nonprofits and orgs are pushing reform and, um, you know, and so when, when people hear community policing, they're like, oh, okay, like, yeah, the police need to, you know, 
we need to police ourselves and the police need to know us better, right? And so that narrative is unfortunately tends to sort of take the, the mic. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, pe people do know people are building fight against this. For example, um, when the mayor was confronted with a grant back in 2018, um, it really was community members and, you know, and of course some, some orgs as well who went to city hall. And then of course the UTLA, the United Teachers of LA, that union as well passed a motion against it. So kind of the combination of all that. Um, it, it really forced the mayor to reject the $430,000 grant in 2018. Um, so, so to answer your question, I think there's a lot of folks who do know, who don't know, right? Um, and so it's kind of a, a mix of everything. Um, but yeah, Akil, Celine, I don't know if y'all want to build on that too. I guess just saying that's the goal is to make as many people no, yeah, so, and um, Julie, exactly what you were saying, that your second question about students. Yeah, we're trying to reach out to, to youth organizations, to teachers, to social workers, to youth. Um, so yeah, everybody who's here, if you have people in mind that you think would be interested that um, you could imagine joining us for a city council action, or if you're part of or associated with different organizations that you might you think we might want to sign on to a letter that we are going to send to the city council. Um, already we have several organizations that signed that letter, including um, Students Deserve, which works closely with um, the U United Teachers of Los Angeles, UTLA. Uh, we also have the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard and BLM LA. We also have um, LA Community Action Network, White People for Black Lives, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Vigilant Love, Palestinian Youth Movement, which obviously we're co-organizing this with. Um, uh, a variety of different organizations have already said. Anak Bayan, which is a, a Filipino youth organization. So various, various groups have already signed our letter, but that's something that if you uh, are interested in, in uh, organizing with us for that city council action, you can join us. Or, or if you have um, youth that are interested in joining us, um, tomorrow at 6 p.m. is our working meeting. Um, and then we'll, we'll have regular meetings after that too. So reach out to, you can send a message to one of us in the chat. Yeah, and I'm so sorry. I forgot one important piece to mention about um, the, the grant proposal that the LAPD put forward for TVTP. The person they proposed to um, head up this, um, the path department um, is this, uh, this cop named Alex Vargas. Um, who uh, currently serves as a deputy director of Los Angeles' Fusion Center. And not only that, but he oversaw the surveillance of protesters during the George, George Floyd uprisings. And so like Nadia had said earlier, these programs like really are meant to pathologize dissent. And this is evidence of that. They, they picked somebody who you know, spent all of last year surveilling uh, folks who um, protested to, to lead it, uh, and, you know, who spent, um, you know, the surveillance against protesters was largely surveillance on black and brown people. So who's better fit? These are more slides on path. Um, we've already gone through it. Should we um, summarize these details of it or? or should we move through them? Then this is actually a paragraph on, on preventing violent extremism in schools, actually. I think we can skip ahead to your part. Okay. Can someone read that paragraph so we can hear it loud and clear? Yeah, so yeah, this is one of the, uh, the roots of this program and FBI, a similar program from the FBI, preventing violent extremism in schools. I know Nadia, you had made the slide. Do you want to read it out loud? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, so basically, it says uh, emerging trends. Um, youth are embracing many forms of violent extremism. Those perpetrated by terrorist organizations or other domestic violent extremist movements. Um, and I think just the embracing part is really right. Just kind of hearing that word. Um, 
uh, domestic violent extremist movements to those maintaining biases towards others due to their race, religion, or sexual orientation. Youth aged 13 to 18 are actively engaged in extremist activities, including online communication with known extremists, traveling to conflict zones, conducting recruitment activities, or supporting plotting against U.S. targets. These factors signify the potential for increased risk within our schools and local communities. Um, that's, yeah, there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, I don't know if folks have, have any thoughts about that, um, but, you know, I mean, I, I just think of of really the age group they're, they're mentioning here, 13 to 18. And I think of the traveling to conflict zones, right? Um, so, so yeah, and, 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 and one thing too, to think about even when thinking of the conflict zones is how, and we're gonna go into this later, is how within academia, there are essentially, um, you know, professors such as Jeff Brantingham and others, you know, uh, out of UCLA and various universities who have really kind of talked about, who have really drawn parallels between um, black and brown youth here as being the domestic threat um, and sort of drawing that parallel to the international terrorist threat. Um, so that's something I see, but yeah, I don't know if folks have any thoughts or, or questions, um, you know, about, about this. I see in the price. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, Susan, if you're, which ones the, there's. I, I figured. Yeah, and and like Celine said, with their claims, no. I mean, it's it's not. And and that's one thing I think you know we have and various people have just really been able to debunk their theories. Their theories are, you know, for lack of better words, full of shit. On top of being racist. It's like Jamie's got uh, their hand raised. Yeah, go for it, Jamie. Hey, so I'm um, just super excited to be, you know, learning more um, about this. I, I think one of the reasons I jumped on um, was to find out a little bit more like about these, you know, non-police mental health responding, you know, kind of um, groups that are becoming, it's, you know, and I, and I appreciate how you guys say it's like not a moment in time that mental health or, you know, the use of like medicine or medical providers or practitioners to be a way that police like infiltrate communities. But um, what was interesting, and I was hoping one of my friends would be on the call today, but they didn't make it. Um, but what's interesting, and I got told, and I'm going to find out more information, so I have very little to bring, but um, that this money that's like going towards these um, like nonviolent um, intervention programs, like just kind of like everything that you guys are explaining, um, these federal funds are actually kind of infiltrating more into these larger groups that are claiming to be abolitionists. And so like what, what like kind of made me uh, really concerned was like, wow, this whole alternative to 911 get up and gig now is starting to become federally funded and how important it is for, you know, and I, and I know that a lot of what we we're talking about here was centering around youth, but also seeing how countering violent extremism programs now are not only being co-opted, but I don't know. So I, I just wanted to see if you all, um, cause I saw that like LA, LA city council had passed for like a, an LA County kind of thing as well, but I guess that's why like I, I jumped on was because I wanted to learn more and I've been taking pictures of the, of the slideshow just to just to kind of start digging and really bringing this to like you know our our other like kind of healing justice movement is you know how to articulate how that in, uh, infiltration happens and just how important it is that this gets out to groups that are kind of thinking they're doing something new by you know calling it nonviolent intervention but really um, it's something that's old, like you guys are saying, and, um, and, and it serves as a way for police and um, to infiltrate, you know, communities as well. So, I, I mean, I guess as a statement and a comment, I don't know, sorry, I just ramble a lot. <laughs> no, that's really good. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and yeah, and Akhil's actually um, going to be talking more about that, but I think, yeah, I think that's a really good point because, you know, I, I feel like sort of the, the medical and education fields 
do sometimes get seen as separate from the state, um, but we know they're not. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I think those become then these spaces where this infiltration is very real and, and happens. So, um, so yeah, and I'll pause there because I know Akhil's going to actually talk more about that in detail, but, but thank you so much for lifting that. Yeah, and, and um, also Celine will too. So I'll be talking first about the, the public health um, and CVE and the way that they're infiltrating mental health spaces. And then Celine is going to talk about referral networks and want to popularize this understanding of what a referral network is and why specifically Zionist organizations are also present in referral networks and what's happening with hate crime referrals and, and basically the state co-opting different kinds of quote unquote crisis response too. So um, if we could go actually past this to, um, yeah, let's, yeah, here. So um, uh, basically one big trend that we're seeing right now in the, in the current moment is, um, is a shift um, in the Department of Homeland Security towards using public health frameworks for CVE and for TVTP and for PVE, all these different acronyms that we use, targeting people under the, under the framework of them being terrorists or violent extremists is taking more and more and more of a public health framework. And that's in no small part due to the work of specific academics all over the country, including ones that worked on the CVE pilot program here in LA as evaluators and recommenders. And they also collaborated with the police including um, on you know, basically developing and giving recommendations on how the police would continue to implement CVE, especially through a department, the Department of Mental Health, so through a public health framework. So on the right, that picture is a, is a forum that they put on in June this year that featured tons and tons of different people from different CVE and TVTP programs around the country talking about what they call violence and terrorism pre prevention through health and well being. One of the presenters was Stephen Wine, who I'm going to talk about in a second, who is a, uh, an academic in um, the University of Illinois, Chicago, who worked on LA's CVE program as a, as a contractor with the Department of Homeland Security. On the left is a book that Stephen Wine and his colleague, um, David Eisenman, who's at UCLA, they put out and it's called Countering Violent Extrem Extremism Through a Public Health Practice. Actually, I think that they were part of it. Um, it's, it's kind of a summary of an extensive workshop that included a lot of the main architects of CVE in LA and around the country, um, as well as mental health experts, et cetera. So we see this and in, in the latest round of grants, the word health appears 14 times throughout the grants, as opposed to in the previous years where it appeared five um, times. So basically there's this, this increased um, they, I think that is a combination of them feeling like it's more effective towards their ends. And also it's a, it's a reform that they think will, will go around the backs of community outrage around these programs. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, these are the two academics that I'm gonna focus on um, for this, uh, for today, but there's actually a lot more that collaborate on um, the, the use of public health frameworks for CVE. The one on the right is David Eisenman from UCLA, and the one on the left is Stephen Wine from um, University of Illinois Chicago. Stephen Wine, um, he's done a lot of his work on sort of mental health, mental health with refugees, and David Eisenman has kind of done a lot of his work on disaster response and you know all, a broad range of disasters and what they, he calls resilience, and it includes things like rising heat levels or you know earthquakes or whatever, random disasters. He was part of sort of Garcetti's group looking at making LA resilient. And um, you know, his, his work, I think for, for both of them, CVE is only part of their work, but obviously it's a very harmful part. The two of them worked together under this framework of something called Project Eval in LA, which is through UCLA to evaluate LA's, LA's a CVE pilot program. And they have gone on to then receive a grant that, that was under a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. Then they received a grant where David Eisenman's the lead uh, grant uh, uh, researcher from the National Institute of Justice, which is basically a part of the Department of Justice, the DOJ. Um, 
to investigate how to make communities report on each other better or more, how to make people feel more comfortable snitching on each other. So, um, and in that grant application, he did ex make explicit reference to sort of like Islamic terrorism, you know, although they all, they both kind of try to couch it in all forms of extremism or all forms of terrorism. So these two are the ones I'm gonna focus on, but there's a bunch of other names. There's a person in Boston who works at the Boston, with the Boston Hospital. There's people all over who are working on public health and CVE, but these two, since they worked so closely in LA, we're gonna focus on them. So next slide, please. So a very common um, thing that I see in research on public health and CVE is the appropriation of basically public health frameworks for tiers. They call them tiers because they're kind of like different levels of uh, activity for different people. They assume to be at different levels of risk. So it comes from sort of like, I think it probably comes from epidemiology and uh, ideas of treating other kinds of public health ills or like harms, workplace you know, issues, et cetera. Um, what they say that, you know, primordial prevention is that I often see that one left off, but that's basically, you know, um, targeting the, the sort of broad level um, issues that would they, they think would contribute to a problem. And then primary prevention is, is what's going to everybody. So primary, both primordial and, and prevention and primary prevention go to pretty much the whole population. And, you know, in the CVE world, what this has sort of looked like is, you know, trainings in schools or propaganda on what constitutes extremism. You know, you'll see, you know, um, the Simon Wiesenthal Center going into schools and saying, oh, well, you have extremism on the left, you have extremism on the right, you have, you know, they have, like, they, they might even prioritize talking about right-wing extremism, but what they're doing is they're normalizing the idea of extremism. Um, and basically primary prevention is supposed to be to, uh, according to them, to treat risk factors in the whole population. Then the second tier, secondary prevention is supposed to be for people they consider to be at risk. So they consider, you know, when you hear people in CVE talk about off ramps, they're going for the, they're talking about secondary prevention. Notice in this other graphic, which came out of George, Georgetown University, that according to them, the behaviors that they're surveilling um, are searching noticeable changes and troubling behavior. Notice that among primary, they don't even say they're not radicalized, they say they're pre-radicalized, meaning they're still people they think have a propensity to be radicalized. It's a very, you know, uh, it's a dismal worldview that everybody around you is constantly, uh, yeah, exactly, Brother Pancake, yes. Um, so, you know, and then basically under secondary, they say that, you know, we want to give credible messengers, you know, we want to give them mentoring and off ramps and counseling, but it's to people that they consider to be um, at risk. And then the tertiary, this is where it's like the edge of the blade. This is where you see people saying, you know, where there, there's criminalization, there's, um, you know, like actual violence perpetrated on people. But the issue is that among all three, there's data collection, you know, especially including in secondary. Secondary is casting a net among all these people they consider to be um, at risk of becoming extremists, but they don't have you know, like a, a cause to, you know, not that they ever needed like an explicit constitutional cause, but, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is that um, all three of, everything is harmful, not, not just the edge of the blade, but any kind of normalizing this idea of the state having an objective definition of extremism and terrorism that it's using to surveil people with. But this tiered framework of public health is, is is, has been appropriated by these academics to use in CVE. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is uh, from, this is from uh, David Eisenman and Stephen Wine's presentation where they're talking about, I mean, this is a, a, a very uh, deep similarity these programs have with eugenics, which I'm gonna talk about in the last slide of my, my section where it's really about pathologizing individuals and communities under their sort of narratives around what causes 
the violence that they can the, the, the program is is supposed to stop. Okay, awesome. Um, so um, you know, if you notice, if you if you zoom in, some of these narratives that they say that the certain communities have are cultural norms that support violence. There's even they mention low social cohesion and connectedness, which is language directly out of Operation Laser and. I think that the two go hand in hand, Susan, between data connection, data collection and predictive analytics, because the way behavioral surveillance works is it takes these behaviors that they consider to be either risk factors or indicators of uh, a future event. It collects them en masse. And I think that they, their goal is to use predictive analytics tools to then comb through that data. So it's a combination of you know, data extraction and collection and then data mining. Um, so you see so many narratives here that are, are then stigmatized and pathologized, anger or hostility to, hostility to others, you know, which is something that's so common among youth. Um, there's also fragmented cultural identity. What, you know, depending, you know, who, somebody saying that in, they could literally be talking about a second generation immigrant. Um, their financial or work stress is basically a euphemism for poverty. Um, association with aggressive or delinquent peers, you know, which is basically similar to social network analysis where they, they consider somebody to be guilty by association with others. There's so many kind of pathologizing narratives in here that are, are also like, it seems like a modern version of like the Moynihan report, you know, basically like targeting families with, you know, accusations of being dysfunctional. Um, so if you go to the next slide, not only did they pathologize families in this way and, and communities and individuals, but another resonance with, um, uh, with uh, eugenics is that Eisenman and Wine basically are, are pushing for the public health sphere, like public health researchers, public health academics, et cetera, to create basically a diagnosable definition of extremism. This is one of the most dangerous things out of this trend because you know we know from the history of the, of the DSM, you know that basically you know pushing for like even like for the example of like homosexuality to be considered an illness, not to mention everything that's you know currently in the DSM. And, you know Lou had mentioned, uh, I'm trying to look for the phrase again. Lou, do you want to talk about that uh, that phrase that something like opposition? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's an official diagnosis in the DSM um, called oppositional defiance disorder. And I mean, yeah, it's largely placed on black and brown children who are unruly in school. And so it gives, uh, you know, teachers and their, the whatever healthcare professionals they have extra leverage to often medicate them so that they are more well-behaved and all that stuff. So yes. Yeah, and and I'm gonna talk about this in a future slide, but it also kind of builds off of the, the, the terms like hysteria, which is also, you know, kind of an arbitrary medicalization of a whole bunch of different things that used to basically specifically surveil and punish women. And then there's, um, there's uh, what they call excited delirium, which is basically a phrase they use to victim blame whenever they kill, like oftentimes black people who are who have mental illnesses, they claim that it's re in re retroactively. Oh, it's not because we suffocated them; it's because of excited delirium. So there's all these different, um, you know, uh, so so-called diseases, so-called you know illnesses that can then be measured and diagnosed. And um, we see Eisenman and Wine pushing for that. Um, so I'll read the quote. Um, Eisenman suggested that public health could also contribute by codifying definitions of violent extremism that lend themselves to prevention programs with a clear connection to health and well being. And then, specifically, um, he likened secondary strategies for detecting behavioral changes in individuals that perceive violent acts to strategies for detecting and addressing the preclinical changes that occur before a disease manifests. That's a complicated way of saying that he's comparing extremism to a disease and saying that 
similar to the way public health tries to see a disease before it manifests, that's what they should do to see extremism before it manifests. So next slide, and I'll try to get through this quickly. Thank you, Matus. Um, we won't have time to look through this in depth, but Eisenman basically created a one-to-one -one correlation between each of the CDC's, what they call the 10 essential public health functions, um, you know, to basically then to be apply, applied to CVE. And some of the ones that are especially disturbing, you know, when it says diagnose and investigate health problems and health hazards in the community, the application that Eisenman's recommending to public health, the public health sphere is to gather and share information on emerging threats and to develop a measurable definition of CVE. Um, so basically it's, it's very much, you know, taking disease response, disease, you know, and epidemiology and kind of like the, so I see Jamie's comment, the criminalization of behavior and mental health condition rather than the mental health issues don't exist. Absolutely, yeah. I'm not trying to, to say that mental health issues don't exist at all. I, I think it's a, yeah, it's an appropriation of, um, of public health concepts that may be very essential um, to then be used for policing. Yeah, thank you for that, that um, nuance. Okay, so the next slide, I think I'm almost done. Um, this is just kind of like a quote from I Eisenman in, in the essay, but yeah, he, he basically said that public health um, can contribute by timely gathering and sharing of information on newly emerging violent extremism issues and accurately diagnosing violent extremism in the first place including by coming up with de definitions and by behavioral criteria that are measurable. So it's really medicalizing it. So and next slide. And specifically one example of this is that they actually held an exercise, Eisenman and Wine, where they took a bunch of mental health professionals from LA's schools, LA's School Threat Assessment and Response Team, and had them try to identify um, radicalization in an actor who is pretending to be a quote unquote Muslim terrorist inspired by ISIL or ISIS. So they did this and you know they also had one pretending to be a white supremacist and they had the school therapists try to diagnose them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they published this without shame in their own essays. Yeah. So finally, next slide. We can skip this one. This was like an early draft of their suggestion for how referral networks could work in Los Angeles. Wait, did, did my, here we go. Um, just to tie into the next speaker, um, the connections to eugenics that we see is that, you know, similar to the history of eugenics as basically a, a scientific racism that claimed to be trying to better the human species by eliminating, you know, unwanted people or propagating the right kind of people basically creating, you know, uh, uh, a social Darwinist like um, hierarchy between human and beast or between human and object where, you know, um, it included mass sterilization. Um, and, you know, just the fact that we're in California here, which was one of the places that really pioneered um, eugenics and indirectly inspired the Nazi regime. Um, we see kind of like similarities here because this is a similarly kind of trying to find a pseudoscientific um, explanation for behavior that overlooks entire swaths of why people might be acting the way they do, including resistance to, to oppression or you know, commitment to, to justice um, or including the legitimacy of armed resistance. Um, Judging, you know, the relative fitness of humans, of or individuals and communities and seeing certain communities as inherently diseased or seeing them as inherently suspicious and prone to violence. Um, marking certain people and there's a twin sort of process, either rehabilitation because they're considered to be, you know, um, in need of being rehabilitated or removal, you know, either through like incarceration or deportation or, or being killed, you know? Um, and we can, you know, I, I imagine the more this gets concretized and the fact that this could contribute to the deportation pipeline by having immigration officials prioritize for deportation, people that the public health industry 
has then labeled as or diagnosed as extremists. Um, I had already mentioned hysteria and excited delirium as, as two similarly like sort of politicized, um, you know, like public health, you know, uh, terms used for policing. Um, and then just to remind people of the fact that these, um, these, these types of extremism that they're surveilling, according to the Biden administration itself, that includes people who oppose capitalism, people who believe the environment is being destroyed, or, or that animal rights are not being observed, people who, who support um, pro-choice or the, the right for abortion, um, people who oppose police brutality, um, or people who uh, have, you know, uh, who believe that the laws and the institutions of this country are unjust. So this is really pathologizing dissent, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, anti-racism as a, as a mental illness to be diagnosed. And finally, you know, it, it kind of maintains a state monopoly on violence by stigmatizing the idea that anybody would, would push for any kind of armed resistance as, as a type of mental illness or as a type of insanity or craziness, um, rather than, you know, so, so only the state can rationally use violence. The people cannot, you know, so according to, according to the creation, creators of these programs. So I'll wrap it up there because I know we have, um, uh, Shakir, who is also going to talk about eugenics and police reform, and also Celine is going to talk about referral networks. But are there any questions about the the public health academics and their bullshit? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, you were saying, um, and I think I, I missed some of it, so I'll have to rewatch the video. But um, I was wondering, you're saying this is coming out of public health the school of public health, not people that are borrowing the public health framework. So these are these are actual like um, public health officials and psychiatrists and and physicians that are participating in creating like new categories in the DSM that are particularly targeting violent extremism. So yes, um, well, David Eisenman is from the School of Public Health in UCLA and Stephen Wine, and he's an MD as well. And Stephen Wine is a psychiatrist. They didn't say anything about the DSM, but they did say they want the public health industry to create a, a, a measurable definition of extremism. So that is implying the DS, you know, something possible to do with the DSM. But you're right; it's not people outside of public health doing it. It is people within. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Oh, I see um, Julie in the chat um, asking for the last few slides. You know, the video will be posted publicly, Julie, on social media and on YouTube. So if you want, you can see that then on Saturday. So you'll be able to share that if you would like. Um, I don't know how successful it'll be because yeah, it's, it's our characterization that this is uh, incarnation of eugenics, but of course, people feel like eugenics is something that ended with the Nazis. And I think that Stop LAPD Spying and many other abolitionist organizations hold that eugenics is still a structuring element of racial capitalism and imperialism, you know, um, structurally element of how society works today. So well, I think that that's a, that's a difference you may encounter. Yeah, well, that's why I was particularly wanted to call your attention to this newly begun, and this just was opened in the summer, the Center for Medicine, Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Cedars Sinai, which is right in your neighborhood at LA. Mm -hmm. And their whole um, reason for existing is in order to prevent uh, the recruitment of doctors to nefarious purposes like this. So I think they would be particularly interested in this. And um, I don't, I don't know that they would sit and watch a whole video, but I, I know the director and I would really like to get, I mean, some of this stuff where you really outline the breakdown of how they, you know, how they see this and the categories, I think that would be really invaluable to pass on. And I would, I would like to do that if there's a way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. That's so good, Julia, that you're saying that because as a registered nurse and, you know, it, it's like really takes activism within like, um, within medical practitioners to actually reject false like science. You know, this, this isn't, this is not even science. This is racism at its core. Um, 
And, and, and it really like deters and confuses, you know, why mental health experiences are happening in communities. And, you know, the fact that, you know, they're experiencing like real rejection of schools because schools are places of oppression most of the time where they're rejecting situations within their community because they're, um, you know, experiencing oppression, but then also that those things cause real mental health conditions that people need to be in safe places to actually be able to work through those things. And they're completely, um, you know, again, just creating spaces where people don't have access. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the contradiction that I feel like we constantly see is that the state eliminates people's just sort of like access to what they need to be healthy and then provides them back in this way that includes surveillance. Um, we have two, we have a comment or a question from Yarden and one from Isaiah as well. Um, Yarden, would you like to say it out loud or, or were you passing, on, passing it on in the chat? Okay, Yardan was giving an example in the chat. You can look at another example of sort of the appropriation of public health frameworks for violence prevention. Um, and they are funded by the CV CDC, fascinatingly enough, and they celebrate broken windows. Wow. Thank you for sending Yardan. And, and then Isaiah, you had a question? Uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I just wanted to say, so uh, I originally went to Cal State LA for psychology, and I, I just noticed that, like, yeah, the, I guess to follow up what Yarden said, that uh, I had two professors. Was, one of them was named, uh, I think it was Alexandra Park, and there was another one that was, uh, what was his name? I, I, I could say in the chat later, like, I'll remember his name. It was like uh, something like Moses or something, but. Yeah, I kind of noticed like the same thing you said, and like like they're getting like these false reasons for like uh, you know, like why they should police the community and say um, you know, like spreading stuff with mental health. Just uh, wondering if like yeah, like you in a ways that would be like counteractive because it's kind of like I wouldn't really understand this, and then when I would you know think more about it like critically and like you know like you know I, I see like all these lies that they're telling like how they're able to. Like, convince people you know and, uh yeah i don't know yeah just like uh yeah ways to counteract like you know the narratives that they're giving at like the schools and stuff yeah absolutely you know one thing that we want to build and continue building because we've done this in the past is uh, a, a network of people who are academics or students who will confront these academics on their bullshit and confront these narratives so we are looking into that, especially because these two specifically did collaborate on CVE in LA and we're, we're thinking that they collaborate on PATH as well, especially Stephen Wine, who was contracted to work specifically also with the Department of Mental Health. So I would say the two ways that we're hoping for is help us confront PATH and cancel this grant and then abolish PATH. Um, and then also help us um, call out these academics as they continue to do their fucked up work. Um, so Navia posted our, our, um, our campaign, um, uh, what do you call it, form. Yeah, so you can do that if you wanna get in touch and then also um, come to our working meeting tomorrow at six, message one of us in the chat. Um, if you wanna come to our working meeting at six tomorrow to work on this, it's on Zoom. Um, tomorrow, and I'm going to pass it, I think, to Shakir to talk about eugenics and reform, or are we going to go to Salim? Oh, Shakir, Shakir first. Okay, Salim saying Shakir first. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks, Akil. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, no, thanks for um, just sharing all that. I was late from another meeting, but um, I honestly don't have a whole lot to add to what, you, like, and I'm glad you're keeping the slide up here of, and just, yeah, just, let's keep it for a little longer of these kinds of connections to eugenics, not only because these elements here of the scientific racism of kind of reducing people um, of, of kind of 
or, or, or turning things into kind of cultural pathologies and trying to, you know, associate by like uh, social and cultural traits with, with, you know, biological characteristics, as well as, yeah, like kind of uh, uh, treating people as future threats or needed to be removed or extracted. I mean, that's one, I think, clear connection throughout history of, of um, how we think of policing and, and crime and, and um, sociology of crime and um, criminology, all of those disciplines. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, so that's, so that kind of connection, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in a minute is like the, the kind of rise of this um, sociology of crime, the field of criminology, like the, like trying to understand why, like, you know, crime, which is a category that's created by the state to like regulate certain behavior, kind of trying to biologize that all of that is kind of that all happens in the same period or originates in the same period that that the eugenics movement um, originates. And so like you were saying, eugenics was this uh, in like up, up until kind of the 1920s, 1930s and, and in the United States was a kind of American homegrown science that was that had really deep influence across much of American society, across the science, across medical science, across other disciplines, including across um, the legal field. Um, uh, kind of a, a really famous Supreme Court justice from that period, Oliver Wendell Holmes, kind of considered one of the the, the most influential, famous, important Supreme Court justices of his time. He was like a Civil War veteran and all of this. Um, has this quote in a, in a case upholding um, uh, uh, forced sterilization laws, which you know, those laws are in effect across the country, saying you know something like that. The 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 point being that you know just as like he sacrificed during the Civil War, society needs to be able to sacrifice people who are the term then was imbeciles or that um, that you know had in what was characterized as mental deficiencies. Society should be able to take to 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 sterilize them and prevent them from committing crimes in the future. Um, so so that period, so that's kind of, I think one aspect, this kind of um, uh, uh, just like, uh, like uh, uh, trying to identify people who are gonna be dangerous in the future and extracting them and just designating them as fit or not fit like here. And then there's also just this broader role of experimentation with policing that over time, you have this notion that okay, policing an institution that we can that that you know we know originates in in enforcement of slavery and slave patrols and enforcement of genocide and settler colonialism and, and enforcing apartheid. This institution that never in its history has been um, free of of racial domination. It's literally that's like a kind of utopian idea that police like policing has never been this bias free non-racist thing that police reformers keep saying, yet there is this commitment throughout history to tinkering with it, trying to calibrate it, trying to figure out this kind of precise level of how much um, racial violence or racial domination, racial bias of policing is acceptable with the trade-offs. Like that kind of tinkering with this institution of racial domination, I think is also, um, like you were saying, because we don't in this country have a meaningful um, uh, kind of uh, grappling with um, the, the the ideologies of, of that era with the, like the really the the kind of lasting influence of enslavement, the lasting influence of racial apartheid and the lasting influence of, of eugenics, we just kind of think of eugenics as like this historical thing rather than something that, you know, has continued to shape ideological fields, including in law and medicine and all these, um, you know, throughout different institutions. So that's, that's, that's the other aspect is like this kind of um, a commitment to experimenting and, and calibrating and tinkering with like the right amount of policing and racial violence. And then there's another kind of just direct connection, which is, um, I think it's related to this is like, just the notion of police reform and working throughout history to keep kind of reforming police there's this conceptual way I'm talking about it that, that, you know, I think it's like has this calibrating, tinkering, trying to experiment with, but also literally um, uh, one of the kind of pioneers of this approach of police reform. Last time I was here, I think I was talking about it and I kept calling this person um, Eugene Vollmer because 
his name is August Vollmer. And then, uh, and I was like, why do I keep calling him Eugene? And okay, I'll figure it out. It's because eugenics, I think I just, you know, <laughs> turning his name into eugenics Vollmer, but his name is August Vollmer, um, was a uh, LAPD chief in 20, uh, in 1923. And before that was um, uh, also police chief up in up in Berkeley in the in the Bay Area. Oh damn, there's a Eugene here. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's a good name. I'm sorry that the that I'm mixing it up with with uh, August Vollmer, but um, uh, was was a police chief up in Berkeley where he pioneered um, uh, this kind of notion of what's now like we, it's everywhere police professionalization. This idea that um, if we kind of uh, train police and, and turn it into like a professional discipline, then then that then will um, then that's going to kind of reduce the the, the 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 harm and excesses of policing. And so he literally created the first um, uh, criminal justice program in the University of California up at Berkeley. He was the first police chief to require kind of formal police training for officers, um, and he was. Uh, absolutely a white supremacist and eugenicist and with that that curriculum that training curriculum for police included topics like eugenics the origin of races race degeneration and and this was just this was part of how he un understood criminology crime and and data and and and, and um you know the the role of police so and you know those are a contradiction that kind of there's this parallel again in in this role of experimentation that I'm talking about and the idea that these structures of uh, what everyone I think recognizes but people won't admit or, or you know certain people I guess don't recognize that these institutions have always been structures of racial domination but that we can kind of fine tune them and make them acceptable through experiment, experimentation and data. That's kind of what um, uh, August Vollmer is just this, this direct connection but also just seeing it throughout including um, today's use of data in 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 policing and kind of data driven policing as this again harvesting uh, science and data to, to decide who's going to be extracted from the community who's going to be a threat in the future that kind of you know if we had a real education if we had a real understanding political understanding of the role of eugenics in this country people like that would be it would it would be really that would stand out that like that that things like this are the, the, you know, that connection I think would be obvious to people, but it's again, because of this failure to confront the history of eugenics and the history of that kind of white supremacist ideology that, that we don't see that. Um, that's, that's all I was gonna share. I don't know, Akil, we're going back to Celine now or? Yeah, I think Celine is now gonna talk about um referral networks and um, the way that sort of crisis response and, and uh, including even alternatives to 911 are being co-opted in the name of countering violent extremism or similar programs. Uh, yeah, I'll be, I'm gonna be pretty brief, but um, yeah, thanks to Kier and Akhil and Nadi and Matthias and everybody. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just talk a little bit about their referral networks. I mean, again, the point of CVE is to outsource policing and deputize educators, uh, social workers, you know, um, mental health service providers, um, faith leaders, to um, do that reporting on these uh, indicators of extremism that are very racist and inherently biased, and um, you know the. And part of the way that CVE would operate is like through these referral networks where they they would they would develop like this way where like institutions, for example, that are um, implementing CVE that are not law enforcement, like uh, like for example, a school or um, um, you know a therapist's office or something would be able to um, collect information, collect data on individuals who are perceived to be at risk of extremism, again, based on these very racist indicators. Um, and that would ultimately go to law enforcement so that law enforcement could intervene. So even if CVE doesn't, um, you know, on the surface level appear to be something that is a law enforcement initiative, it absolutely is. It's it's about criminalizing, um, it's, it's about criminalization and also the other piece about these referral networks that we're seeing is that, um, like for example, in Los Angeles, there are these like 
key third party organizations that are not law enforcement that are also involved, very, very involved in implementing CVE. Um, they do work very, very closely with law enforcement and they have like these reporting hotlines where people can call and report instances of hate or, um, and even the way that they categorize or define hate is very, um, it's like vague enough to include um, things like uh, political organizing or taking political positions that are anti-racist, anti-Zionist, anti-capitalist, and those things could be considered, you know, quote unquote hate. And that could be, you know, that could be counted as like some a hate crime or that would end up in like basically the referral network. And um, what is really interesting is that um, we, um, you know, like we, to, a couple of us joined this like LA, I think it's like the civil and human rights equity department that hosted a, a, a discussion about like basically the future of hate prevention. And it was just basically about CVE and included David Eisenman who, the, the UCLA academic that um, and CVE grant recipient that Akhil was talking about earlier, who was just talking about like, you know, we need to develop approaches to um, uh, like, we have to develop models for preventing and responding to hate at local, statewide and national levels. And um, ultimately like the goal that Eisenman was talking about is to basically pathologize the state's risk factors for hate. Um, to also like just continue to legitimize surveillance. Um, so it's basically the same thing as CVE, it is CVE. And um, what they were talking about too is that they wanted to eventually like merge the databases of these third party organizations. And when I say third party organizations, I'm talking about groups like the Anti-Defamation League that have uh, like, that are part of different like reporting networks or like referral networks and organizations like Simon Wiesenthal Center's Museum of Tolerance. And we've talked about these organizations on these webinars before. Um, but the goal was to like merge the, those, um, the, their databases with LAPDs to get a sense of like, you know, to, to have like a shared network of um, this reporting. Um, and then again, like, as we've talked about, like the, throughout this webinar, the, what the reporting looks like, again, is based off of these um, very racist indicators of quote unquote extremism and the goal of these referral networks, the goal of these programs are to expand the reach of law enforcement into places that shouldn't be available to them, like the classroom, like the therapist's office, like, um, you know, like religious institutions and wherever. And again, deputizing educators, counselors and other service providers to report on community members. So developing these networks where they can involve different agencies in these referral networks to report on individuals that are perceived to be prone to extremism. And then again, it ultimately will go to law enforcement where, and they will intervene. Um, and what those interventions look like will vary. Um, again, like we've talked about, like in the UK, we've seen even deportations or people having their citizenship stripped away. We've seen incarceration, like we've seen arrests. So it can really range. And um, again, the goal of these reform networks are to also intensify the relationship between mental health sector uh, like, for example, with PATH, definitely to int intensify the relationship between the mental health sector and lo like local law enforcement agencies. Um, and I wanted to also just share a little bit about an uh, uh, organization that we have been, you know, organizing with that isn't on this webinar right now, but uh, they're called Vigilant Love and they have a campaign that's addressing specifically racialized profiling and surveillance of um, patients in therapy, social work and counseling. Um, and their, the goal of their campaign um, is to uh, provide tools and training to understand how the national security apparatus endangers the safety, confidentiality, and accessibility of trauma-informed mental health care, um, and to uh, re reject and resist the rising trend of state surveillance in the mental health field. And they have also a value statement on their website for uh, social workers, therapists, um, that talks about, you know, just rejecting the collaboration between mental health service providers and the Department of Homeland Security, um, rejecting the co-optation of mental health services through the expansion of the terror industrial complex and community policing initiatives, um, and rejecting the theory, the radicalization theory, um, rejecting the idea that there even is a path towards radicalization. There is no such thing. It's been repeatedly debunked. It's pseudoscience. Um, and under and developing this understanding among therapists and social workers that these indicators ultimately serve to criminalize religious and political expression. They are not 
meant to actually target whatever is defined as extremism. This is just a way to criminalize, um, you know, our communities criminalize and neutralize political organizing. Um, and it's it's a value statement to get um, mental health providers to reject any trainings on CVE, any trainings on these indicators or risk assessments that involve indicators that um, the DHS has been pushing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, uplift their campaign here and, and their organization for the work that they're doing and uh, rejecting national security in the mental health field and in working. Uh, I think they're currently also developing um, uh, a, like a curriculum and also just a network of like social service providers who are um, involved in resisting CVE um, in, in, the, in the field. So yeah, I'll just stop there for now. I don't know if I missed anything, Akil. Yeah, can I um, just add one thing to the, I, I, you might have covered this already, but that webinar that David Eisenman went on where he was, where they were talking about these referral networks, it was also, um, and I, I, we don't have to have this slide on for this. Um, it was also, uh, another person on the webinar was actually council member Nithya Raman. And her big thing on that webinar was she wants to consolidate and expand hate crime reporting. And one thing that we um, really ground our understanding of hate crimes in the coalition in is that ultimately they, they keep on getting used, weaponized against the community that ostensibly they're there to protect. So for example, in Utah, a person got a hate crime for stomping on a back the blue pro police sign or you know uh in a, in maine at a college um students were investigated for hate crimes for anti-zionist graffiti um there there keeps on being these different examples and uh, i just want to share in the chat the uh the resolution that she put forward nithya raman um keep in mind that these referral networks as as a Celine was saying they often include these third party agencies, including the Anti Defamation League, which is on the 211 um, referral network, and um, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center. But not only that, they're not true alternatives to 911 as long as they coexist in the same information sharing environment as the police. In other words, if they're only an, in name a different thing from 911, but then the police still get alerted for different things. It's not an alternative to 911. It's not the same thing as a community driven alternative. Um, so in this, they want to basically increase reporting through the development of a mobile app or integration into my LA 311. It, it seems like a hate crime, sim similar thing to iWatch. iWatch and the SAR program, where they also uh, you know, proliferated the use of this app. Um, as a way of, of increasing reporting. Although this one is geared towards hate crimes, which you know, ostensibly communities, they might even think that they, 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 want, to, they want to be you know, behind it because they think it might be a, a tool to protect them against um, white supremacy or you know, anti-Asian violence or anti-Muslim racism, et cetera. Um, but remember that it's not a true alternative as long as the police, I mean, as long as the police are literally collaborating on it. So um, not only that, but she wants to consolidate basically um, a t the create a tool for analyzing what she calls regional hate related data. And uh, one thing they mentioned in the webinar was um, possibly being inspired by the work of, of, a, of an academic who is also sort of mapping, uh, mapping hate uh, or actually mapping racism. Oh, thank you, Mamta, for posting that. Is that a, is that a critique of hate crime as a framework? Yeah, exactly. So this quote is from Dylan Rodriguez, who's actually been on webinars by Stop LAPD Spying before, who says, reminder, hate crime is a criminal category created by the US state, um, the FBI, to isolate slash individualize violence that often has origins in the behavior of the state itself. For example, policing, war, presidential rhetoric, et cetera. It's a lazy term that is used wrongly and too often. So um, yeah, so we, we see this moving and, and we're like keeping an eye on it. So um, stay tuned 
about that, but it's it's a proliferation of false art alternatives to 911 and sort of false protection from white supremacy through the very state that actually commits white supremacy. Mm. So we have 15 minutes for discussion and questions, unless there's anything, Nadia, Matios, Ni. Oh, we have Savannah on. Oh, Savannah, I, I didn't, okay, great. I didn't know you were able to come. Uh, Savannah was gonna be a guest speaker. Would you still have the ability to, or the interest in speaking a little bit to the subject? Yeah, I didn't really prepare anything. I'm calling in from Denver. Um, I'm a public health consultant. I have my master's in public health specializing in American Indian public health. Um, and so I work for a large company. I like to do organizing and um, work for the community, but a lot of our grants are funded by the state. So kind of just seeing how they really um, structure how, what we can say. I work particularly in tribal health and reproductive health. Um, and I was just listening to a podcast, uh, the Reproductive Health and National Training Center, which is partially what I work on. Um, and they were just talking about the history of eugenics in the birth rights movement and um, birth control and um, the long, um, like the implants on IUDs being pushed on communities of color, uh, the pill being tested on brown communities, brown and black communities. Um, and then how that in turn kind of um, makes communities of color, um, you know, with the COVID vaccine, like there is definitely um, a reason for hesitancy for a rollout just from the history of, of uh, the testing on our bodies. Um, so yeah, I didn't really prepare anything, but if we, I could, you know, um, contribute to the discussion in any way. Thank you. Um, were there any um, either questions or comments or criticisms or any other things about the, the uh, different topics we covered today? Oh, Hamid. I have a yeah. I have a quick question uh, uh, for Savannah uh, that you know we've had in the past. Uh, um, indigenous uh, youth coalition folks um, on uh, the webinars as well, uh, talking about some of these things. So uh, you know, just working, um, you know, in, in communities. Have you seen uh, you know the 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 particular targeting of indigenous youth or? Uh, um with programs which would otherwise be seen more like in the in the broader national security framework because this is where this policing of the youth is going by criminalizing youth as a national security threat now thankfully i've only seen uh positive organizations like we are native out of um oregon um so again native run organizations do better for um native communities so really focusing on um, the right to make decisions for your own body, um, using inclusive language. Um, so yeah, I haven't really run into that. Um, I just started my, my job um, at this company with consulting. And prior to that, I was working for a school of public health here in Colorado. Um, and the difference between working for a private organization versus a university is very different. Thank you. I, I also have a question about that too. When you were doing your studies in public health or in your work as a public health professional, what did you encounter in terms of treating violence or, or certain or behaviors as a public health issue? Like, did you ever encounter, you know, either like, is there a ch chapter in, in standard textbooks on that? Are there particular people who really pioneered that 
And do you have any kind of, of your own criticisms of that? So um, when you were talking about um, like the, um, the CVE and TVTP, we didn't discuss that at all in my curriculum. Um, I attended North Dakota State. Um, they dissolved the American Indian Public Studies program shortly after my class graduated. So there is no longer that emphasis on American Indian health there. Um, but we talked more about um, demedicalizing like the birthing experience, um, behavioral health. And again, my program being American Indian focused was about holistic care which I really liked, but definitely when I attended classes um, that was outside of my specialization um, with majority white students in Fargo, North Dakota, um, there was definitely pushback for them to think beyond um, their own experiences, especially knowing that they would work in communities of color and rural communities beyond that. So it was more of um, pushing the envelope on professors who have been in their uh, position for a really long time and students who haven't really um, had experiences outside of their own. Thank you. Um, yeah. And, oh, I just, yeah, no, no, I just wanted to also say, um, yeah, uh, hi, Savannah, welcome. Um, yeah, I, I can really relate a lot to, to that experience. Um, in the the teacher credential program i feel like was pretty much the, the same spot on and um and yeah and um definitely would love to to connect and talk more and build more with you um you know i think um uh, one of the pieces of these programs that's particularly alarming is bringing in the like the community element right and so kind of this push for community policing and so a lot of times you know and we've seen some of these grants going to um to indigenous and native groups and orgs and so you know i think um i think it would be it'd be good and, and you know would love to, to follow up and just kind of connect and, and talk more with you so so thank you so much for for joining us tonight yeah thanks for inviting me i would love to connect with you all um yeah i don't know if anybody else okay sorry you were going to say something i go for it I just wanted to see if um, if Lou was interested in possibly expanding a little bit more on their, their criticisms of the DSM and sort of educating us on a little bit of the, so what that is and how it's been used to harm people. If you're still there, Lou. Yeah, I'm here. Um, sure, I'm definitely an expert by no means. Um, I would consider myself like a psychiatric survivor, I guess. There's, you can look up the psychiatric survivor movement. There's a whole bunch of us out there um, who are very critical of the DSM. Um, basically, I mean, a lot of this stuff kind of fits in with like my criticisms of it, honestly. It's a like very ahistoric and a non-scientific document, <laughs> you know, like it doesn't take into account uh like societal issues that like poverty that might cause people to have mental health issues and the reason it's not really scientific is because it like it bundles a bunch of like um so where i'm like symptoms together and then like puts them into a category of of like an official diagnosis kind of like what you said before of like hysteria Hysteria for like the longest time was only uh, only wi uh, women were diagnosed with hysteria, um, and you can look at like very clear like social, cultural, economic contexts as to why women were being diagnosed with this, um, and it has now changed to um, borderline personality disorder is essentially like the modern version of hysteria, um, and it is again now still primarily only women are diagnosed with it. Um, if you look at psych med usage, especially amongst children, uh, black children are by far the most heavily medicated for like very intense mental health disorders that they supposedly have. But again, it's all completely decontextualized. None of it takes into account the racist society that they've grown up in. Um, or any like really social, cultural um, th 
things. There's a really good, I'll put a book in the chat for people. Um, it's called The Anatomy of an Epidemic. And basically it kind of looks at like why we, with all of the psych meds that are available, psychological disorders seem to only be going up as opposed to like getting cured and people feeling better. Um, and it basically points to like, oh, because a lot of these disorders that are in the DSM are not really, there's very little scientific rigor <laughs> that actually goes into an, a, di a like diagnosis becoming an official disorder. It's, yeah, a lot of people just kind of deciding and voting based and cherry picking data. Yeah, a very short spiel. Um, if you want, I know that Julie, you have a hand raised. If you couldn't put it in the chat because we have to close out, um, if you could put your comment, um, but I, I'll try to keep it open for people to read that comment while I'm just telling everybody that um, uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m., just to repeat, we have our working meeting. And this is where we're going to specifically spend the, uh, you know, the first part of the meeting um, planning for the upcoming possible city council meeting where they will be voting to, you know, to accept or to reject that grant from the Department of Homeland Security um, to train these 500 informants on extremism. So everybody uh, uh, stay tuned for a city council action, which might happen in the next, you know, several weeks or in January. Um, and uh, if you're interested in getting involved, message one of us um, in the chat uh, I know Hamid has an announcement after this, but message one of us in the chat your email and we can make sure that you get the Zoom link for tomorrow. Uh, I know that one person already did, thank you. Um, so you should get your Google Calendar invite for tomorrow's. Um, and uh, I, Hamid, you wanna make your announcement? Sorry for that, I was muted. Just want to let folks that uh, next Tuesday would be our last uh, meeting for the year, uh, December 21st. But we're also starting the online version of uh, the group reading of our report, Automating Vanishment, uh, the Surveillance and Policing of Looted Lane. And uh, we've invited a Tongva community elder, Grand Gloria, who's going to be joining us. Um, to to launch this uh, collective reading, it's going to be six a part of six uh, reading sessions over a period of uh, you know every two or three weeks. So please join us. It's uh, it's uh, um, probably yeah. There you go. There's the 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 link. Thank you, Akhil. Um, it's a groundbreaking report, and uh, we this was written by by the community uh, collectively. So we want to have this reading collectively as well. So so hopefully look for the the Zoom link and all that, six, same time, 6 p.m., uh, Tuesday, December 21st. Thank you. I think that's it for this meeting. You all have finished two minutes early. Hope to see some of you at 6 p.m. tomorrow. I think we've closed, Hamid. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all. This one will be the mall. Shit. Thank you all. Great lesson. <laughs>